Hello and good evening to you. Welcome to News 360 that is live. My news up here at Adesawe in Kanda. My name is Alfred Kansi. And I'm Natalie Fort. Let's take a look at the headlines this evening. News 360 headlines is brought to you by... Some political parties want President Ekufuado to ignore petition calling for EC chair to be impeached. Government to introduce policy to prevent use of gas cylinders at home and factories. Three months after governments clamped down on illegal miners in the country, residents of some mining communities in the Ashanti region say the quality of polluted water has improved. Well, in a business this evening, some local contractors are calling for a legislation uh, that will compel government to make payments within a stipulated period or face some sanctions. So we're we'll getting all these and more tonight here on News 360. Stay with us for the next 60 minutes as we bring you the news. Let's go on to our first story uh, this evening where Deputy Energy Minister Mohammed Amin Adam is saying that very soon government will prevent individuals from owning gas cylinders for domestic and industrial use. Well, in an exclusive interview with TV3 News, he said the policy will be part of a new LPG circulation directive that aims at preventing fatalities due to mishandling. There have been several instances of gas explosion across the country in the recent past, leading to several deaths and injury to many Ghanaians. This has triggered a new demand for an LPG circulation policy that will regulate the use of gas domestically and industrially. We need to license companies that will have their branded cylinders, okay, that will fill the cylinders and then take the gas to the homes and also continue to provide services. As part of the many recommendations to improve the efficiency of distribution of LPG, Government says there is a program to stop individuals and organizations from owning gas cylinders in the future. The companies that will be providing LPG services will be the owners of the, of the cylinder. And then you have to pay both for the commodity LPG as well as for the services that they are, they are providing. Some Ghanaians who spoke to TV3 welcomed the move and called for effective supervision. It will be better for us. If they can come, well, we have to call them at that particular moment to come for the cylinders. The trust is not there because individuals want to see how the gas is felt, whether it's full or not. Government will start it fine, but the people that maybe they have to come, at the end of the day, the question is, are they going to do it the way the government is wants? Who is going to supervise that thing? The Deputy Energy Minister says government expects licensed gas retailer companies with branded cylinders to operate door-to-door -door retailing the product. According to Dr. Mohammed Amin, government is assuring current operators in the sector that their businesses will not be collapsed. We want to incorporate them as the face of the new policy. For instance, we may have two or three you know, retailers who can be asked to merge, to take a license, and they are supported to be able to transport the, the gas the LPG to the doorsteps of, of consumers. A visit to some gas retailing points in the capital, including Trinity Gas, Go Gas, and World Gas Company, showed brisk business. Meanwhile, some retailers of LPG are opposed to the idea since it may lead to the collapse of their businesses. <laughs> this policy cannot hold. Because the system that we are having in Ghana cannot switch this type of system that maybe other countries are using. And it will affect a lot of customers. Business will collapse. We don't have tankers, so what are you going to do? Uh, to de do delivery. That, that's the reason why we say to affect we the retailers. Government says it will continue with further consultations with the Association of LPG Distribution Companies to address their concerns. Government ultimately will have to weigh the business interest of retailers of LPG and the comfort of several Ghanaians across the country in putting together the final draft of the LPG circulation policy. Rabi Al Hassan reporting for TV3 News. 
In other stories this evening, third prosecution witness in the trial of the murder of former Upper East Regional Chairman of the MPP, Asigri Quinn, has insisted the deceased mentioned the name of Gregory Afoko and Alangdi Asagbe as those who poured acid on him. He denied the position of the counsel for Gregory Afoko that the deceased, Adams Mahama, was dead before he arrived at the hospital. The third prosecution witness, Asigri Quinn, ended his cross-examination telling the court the deceased Adams Mahama was still alive when they arrived at the hospital for medical attention. This was in response to the defense counsel of Savo Boabwin's question that the deceased was dead before he arrived at the hospital. He said when the deceased arrived at the hospital, he was able to ask the witness to call one Tofik and added if the deceased was dead upon arrival at the hospital, he would not have been able to ask for Tofik in the presence of the nurses and some other people. Asigri Queen was the one who drove Adam's mama to the hospital and insisted he was not unconscious. He told the court he was not a close associate to Adams Mahama and Tofik and he only saw Tofik for the first time at the hospital. He said when he saw Adams Mahama in his house on the day of the incident, he was in great pain and also at the time he left him at the hospital, he was still going through a lot of pain. Apart from Hajia Adams, Madam Isaka and Asigri Quinn, the prosecution will invite off more witnesses to testify against Gregory Afoko. Trial has been adjourned to October 25. Away from the court, the West African Examinations Council, WIAG, has implicated eight students for alleged impersonation. The results of the students, which are part of the 185 schools found culpable for various malpractices in the 2017 WASI examinations. The West African Examinations Council withheld the results of 185 schools for alleged examination malpractices. Out of the figure, 31 schools were found culpable to have been assisted by vigilators. Others were said to have smuggled into the exam hall with mobile phones and photocopied answers. As a result, examiners noted repetitive answers and errors during marking. For these reasons, the exams council has suspended the release of results awaiting investigations. Public relations officer of the council, Agnes Tekudo, said the investigations would be concluded by the end of this month. Some received assistance from invigilators and supervisors or external assistance. Those ones, we have the evidence. We just need approval of our committee to cancel. So definitely some results will be cancelled. But we cannot say for sure whether all the results that we have withheld will be cancelled. Currently, more than 54% of students have passed English language paper, an improvement of last year's figure of 53%. In mathematics, 43% passed, which is an improvement of last year's figure of 33%. However, more than 20% failed most of the core subjects. Let's look at those who have failed for this year for um, English language. When you look at English language, we had 20%. Mathematics, also 20%. Social studies, 23%. Integrated science, 26% for this year. Again, the public relations officer said those who failed would be offered the opportunity to rewrite their papers. Away from education, the National Democratic Congress has warned it will resist any attempts to remove the chairperson of the Electoral Commission from office. At a media encounter to assess the first six months of the MPP, the minority leader of Parliament, Haruna Idrisu, was alarmed by subtle moves by elements of government to impeach the head of the country's Electoral Commission. Concerns about a high rate of unemployment and lawlessness dominated the NDC's assessment, which lasted close to an hour. Fresh allegations of corruption and abuse of power contained in a petition to remove the current chairperson of the Electoral Commission caught the attention of the party. Leader of the NDC in Parliament, Haruna Idrisu, did not mince words, warning government of any subtle attempt to remove the chairperson of the Electoral Commission. What President Akufuado must remember with his MPP is that the, ele the same electoral commissioner in whom today they have doubt declared him president of the republic. And therefore he should know that when the sovereign will and the voices of the people speak, we will walk him quietly out on the basis of the sovereign mandate of the people of Ghana. 
Therefore, if he thinks that getting control of the referee of our elections is an important thing to do, we are reminding him that he should not extend his encroachment and political polarization of the public and civil service to the Electoral Commission of Ghana. The NDC was worried about what they claimed is the politicization of key public institutions. The wanton dismissal of Ghanaians who have been lawfully employed in state institutions will not be allowed to go on with such impurity. The politically motivated mass transfers of public sector workers will not be allowed to continue in the capricious manner in which it began. The party said the six months period spent by the NPP in government had been characterized by joblessness, corruption, wanton display of nepotism, and favoritism. The nebulous Akufuado Baumia government has given more money, 1.5 billion Ghana cities, to the office of the president in this year alone than all the money received by the same office under the entire four years of President Mahama. The alleged acts of corruption in the $2.25 billion bond deal, sale of the contaminated fuel by Bost, and also condemned the massive transfers and removal of key officers within the civil service. Corruption. It is moral corruption, spiritual corruption. I mean, corruption that, that wrecks nations. You come into governance and you, as a nation, you just bring your relatives into all the positions. Nations are not governed like that. They can only cheat the people all the time. But on one occasion when they rise, then all of us will bend. Well, work on the $13.9 million state residence for the vice president being constructed by Consort Limited has come to a standstill as we speak. Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Bamia has hinted government will renegotiate the deal. The residence for the vice president is located at cantonment in Accra. Our investigations revealed work has stalled. A plain-clothed security man at the entrance who preferred to speak off camera indicated work has stalled for some time now. At the recent media encounter with the president, the vice president, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, stated government would work to ensure the successful completion of the project. The vice president indicated the country will not accept the 13.9 million cost tag on the building because it was inflated by the previous government. I don't know if there's any work going on, but I doubt it very much at the moment. I think there's no work going on. And at the, the whole issue has been around how the cost of this building, and it may have to be renegotiated, but it probably doesn't make sense for Ghana to leave it lying idle. I think we need to sit down with the contractor and see how it can be renegotiated uh, so that it can be completed. We are starting from the position that $14 million is way too high uh, for a, a bungalow. So that, that's where we are. The vice president is currently residing in his own accommodation at Nima residential area in Accra. Let's return to stories on education this evening as pupils and students of the Tebu Community Basic School in the Gar South municipality sit and write on the floor. Half of the school also study under shed and trees. Peter Kwawa Data reports teachers spend between 10 and 15 CDs a day on Okada to access this remotely sited school as pupils have to swim across rivers. This picture caught our attention on social media. By 7 Thursday morning, this reporter was in a school about 15 kilometers from Domiabra. The remotely sited Table Basic School began in 2005 by a private individual but was ceded to government in 2011, attracting its first standard block. The same year, the school was enrolled onto the school feeding program. However, inadequate infrastructure and furniture remain a major challenge for effective academic work. Until recently, kindergarten one and two study under this shed and trees. The entire junior high school also has no permanent structure. 
academic activities in these classes automatically come to a halt whenever it threatens to rain. When it is raining, we find it difficult when learning. And sometimes we run to the other classes after the raining before we come back and learn again. Another major challenge is inadequate furniture. More than half of the students' population come to school with kitchen stools and plastic chairs. Even then, they sit on the floor and use the stools as tables. The kindergarten children, who could not bring their own stools, sit on mats and write on the bare floor. And this is where they can't write well. Sometimes they suffer from their spinal cord. Sometimes some of them even kneel on the ground before they write. But these are not the only challenges of the scattered settler farming community. Teachers reside at Kaneshi, Kaswa, Domiabra and Denchira, all in the greater Accra region. Others are at Papasi and Goma Budumburam in the central region and spend between 10 and 15 cities on Okada each day to school, aside what they spend on Trotro from their various locations to Papasi and Domiabra. Even more, both teachers and pupils cross several rivers to access the school. This situation, we were told, becomes dangerous during the raining season. At least one people reportedly got drowned in this river this academic year. The rivers are a major problem for our effort to educate our world. Sometimes a section is cut off completely for many days, including the teachers. We need urgent assistance to address all these challenges. The head teacher, Emmanuel Bagut, wants urgent intervention. Because if you look at the way the children are sitting and they are writing on stools, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not encouraging. So the first thing we need is furniture. And the second thing is the, the KG structure, the GSS structure and teacher's bungalow. Again of concern to the school is lack of portable water. This borehole sunk in 2016 reportedly worked for only one week, compelling people to spend hours to travel for water when their rainwater is used. In spite of all these challenges, the school we were told is doing well academically, representing the Gans South in the 2017 Basic School Quiz competition. Well, uh, the northern and middle sectors of the country are expected to experience cases of thunderstorm and rains tonight. The coastal sector is expected, however, to, cloud, to be cloudy with cases of slight rains, occasional drizzle, uh, especially over the western and central coast. The night will be relatively cool with early morning mist or fog patches over the mountainous and uh, forested areas as well as the coast. The day will be partly cloudy with sunny intervals and late night cases of rain across the country. Let's find out how the weather will be throughout the night into tomorrow morning. Watching News 360, let's take a look at what's still ahead in the bulletin. Okay, uh, as we go on in the bulletin this evening, the government uh, to introduce policy to prevent the use of gas cylinders. And also, three months after government clamped down on illegal miners in the country, residents of some mining communities in the Ashanti region say the quality of polluted water has improved. We have these stories shortly as well as the very latest from the world of business with Park Lucia Stary. Stay with us.
Hello, good evening and welcome to the very latest in the world of business. My name is Pa Kwesi Asari. In our very first story, the head of finance at the University of Ghana Business School, Professor Godfred Bokbin, has blamed the persistent high cost of credit to the monetary policy transmission mechanism of the central bank. He wants the central bank to improve its transmission mechanism specifically in the relationship between inflation, monetary policy and treasury bill rates to bring down the cost of credit. The average interest charged by commercial banks on loans fell marginally to about 33% according to data from the central bank. The downward movement in the cost of credit, although marginal, comes after major drivers on interest rates continue to fall. Inflation for June dropped to 12.1%, the lowest since 2013. The 91-day Treasury bill currently is at five-year low at 11.93%. The monetary policy rate currently stands at 22.5%, and the city has seen some stability with year-to-date depreciation at about 4%. Despite these variables going down, the average cost of credit remains. The president at his encounter with the media acknowledged the need to bring down the cost of credit. We have to continue to work to bring down the cost of borrowing, to enable businesses to have access to much needed credit. Head of Finance at the University of Ghana Business School, Professor Godfrey Bokpin, noted banks continue to charge high lending rates because the current policy rate and the other variables do not offer sufficient incentive for banks to lower their lending rates. If you look at where the policy rate is and where inflation rate is and the fact that inflation expectation is also coming down, that huge gap does not offer incentive to banks to also lower their lending rate necessarily. So if the current uh, MPC rate is 22.5% and we are saying that commercial banks, universal banks could borrow from the central bank at a rate as high as 22.5% with a certain margin or so, then that is already very high. He challenged banks to devise ways of assessing cheaper loans to bring down the cost of credit. One of the things that the central bank will consider in their, in their meeting will be the transmission mechanism of this policy rate and then the treasury bill rate in the market. All right, so we'll see what happens later uh, in the week when the Monetary Policy Committee of the Central Bank meets uh, to uh, deliberate on the health of the economy and also to announce uh, a possible new rate. Now, in other news, Chief Executive, so Chief Executive of Cocoa Board, Joseph Boahin Edu, says government will reverse Ghana's declining trend in cocoa beans production. He said, besides targeting 1 million tons production per annum or more within the next four years, it will make cocoa farming a lucrative venture and attractive to the youth. The world's second highest producer of cocoa beans after Ivory Coast. However, its cocoa output, which was over 1 million tons in the 2010-2011 crop year, has declined to an average figure of 830,000 metric tons per annum in the past five years. This low productivity is caused by poor soil fertility, poor quality of planted materials, disease and pest issues. Other causes include the fact that many farmers operate on small scale with average land sizes of 2 to 3 hectares. To help deal with these challenges, the chief executive of Cocoa Board, Joseph Wahin Edu, said Cocoa Board has rolled out programs to improve the productivity of cocoa farmers, which currently stands at an average yield of 450 kilograms per hectare. Improve upon the agronomic practices to enable the farmers increase production. So if you're at one bag per hectare, we want you to move up to say 20 bags or 30 bags per hectare. The hand pollination, for example, right now um, farmers, you know, are having about 20 pots per tree, 30 pots, maximum 50 pots per tree. But the hand pollination, the farmer can get about 80 pots, 100 pots, if he does it well, he can even have about 200 pots per one tree. He said Cocoa Board will support farmers whose farms have been affected by the swollen shoot disease so they will not lose tenure of their farmlands. We are going to support them for their gestation period, which is usually three years. 
And whilst we are doing that, we also have to support the landowner. You know, it's just the same fundamental principles of um, share cropping arrangement. 50% for you, 50% for me as a landowner. Well, in other news, Express Capital Microfinance is now Direct Savings and Loans Limited Company. The Chief Executive Officer of Direct Savings and Loans, Ben Eduowusu, promised existing and prospective customers of hard work, discipline and customer satisfaction. Formerly Express Capital Microfinance, the indigenous second tier banking institution was incorporated in 2012. It was now rebranded Direct Savings and Loans Limited. The Chief Executive Officer, Bene Duosu, said the firm recognizes the role that private sector investment and innovation play in Ghana's economic development. He assured the red savings and loans will remain steadfast in this commitment to contribute to the national interest. We are confident that the partners, customers and our regulator will observe that an institution such as ours, which has been built on solid, tried and tested foundation, will continue to remain a relevant financial services partner for micro, small and medium enterprises in Ghana. The Vice President of Ghana, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, lauded the initiative and encouraged the private sector to support government in its development efforts. Nambang Financial Institutions, or MBFIs, play a critical role in building a strong and viable financial sector for the development of the national economy and their stability and expansion will remain critical to the financial inclusion agenda. They own and operate key infrastructure and are expected to be more innovative in the delivery of their services. The Red Savings and Loans Company will focus on satisfying customers by offering services including access to credit, offering employment and harnessing the entrepreneurial spirit of citizens. Oh, we're sorry. Well, that's all for the very latest in the world of business. My name is Park Yasari. Thanks very much for watching. For more news, log on to our website, 3news.com. Thank you very much. Park the news in the world of business. Now, the National Democratic Congress, NDC, and Progressive People's Party, PPP, won President Ekofuada to ignore the petition by some concerned workers of the Electoral Commission to impeach its chairperson, Shalom to say, however, the ruling NPP is saying that the law should take its course to ascertain the truth or otherwise of the allegations. The petitioners accused Charlotte Osei of misconduct, citing breaches of some provisions of the constitution regarding her office, conduct and duties. According to the National Democratic Congress, NDC, the issues have, the issues have been politicized and cautioned the president in handling it. The linkage of MPP to the petition, you know, really is very disturbing and gives us the impression that there is, there is a strong hand of the MPP in what is happening. And we are saying that if that is the case, then they should desist from it because it is to not be good for the future of this country. The Progressive People's Party is of the view impeachment of the EC boss would be a bad precedent for the country. The party, however, expects investigation into the allegations. Much as we do not support the impeachment process, we would like to call on her to, now that the election is over, she should sit down, do an internal introspection of herself and forget about that, that attitude of she's going to sue the people here and there. I don't think it is going to solve that problem. But the New Patriotic Party says the law should be allowed to take its full course without interference. If they have any substance to prove that MPP is having a hand, then so be it. But once they don't have any uh, excuse, any grounds, any, any reason to say that, we should treat it with the contempt that it deserves. Three months after governments clamp down on illegal miners in the country, residents of some mining communities in the Ashanti region say the quality of the hitherto polluted water has improved. Communities commended the government for the sustained fight. Here's a report by Ibrahim Abubakar. In March this year, government began a clamp down on illegal mining. The government directed both illegal and registered small-scale miners to move all mining equipment from sites across the country as part of measures to curb the menace. Three months on, the intervention seems to be yielding some positive results. 
some of the mined pits have been reclaimed whilst others have been left uncovered. Polluted water bodies are gradually regenerating their natural ecology. A resident of Abodom in the Amansia West District, Paul Kusi, is happy about the level of improvement in their water bodies. To be honest, I can say there has been a, a, an improvement of the water because now, if not because we are afraid of drinking chemicals, I can say we can drink some of the, uh, the, the, the waters. He pleaded with the government to strictly regulate the activities of mining after the ban to avert resumption of such operations which destroy water bodies. The situation is not different at Akropon, a mining community in the Amansia West District. Some residents have started fetching water from the Nguyen River for mining activities and other domestic chores. A resident, Bismarck Owusu, commended the government for the war against illegal mining, but asked for all the mine pits to be covered. The residents want government to ensure the miners commit to complying with the mining laws. Well, a director for community policing, ACP Habiba Chumesi, is saying that the recent La Paz shooting incident, which resulted in the demise of Constable Daniel Owusu, will not stop the police from being effective. She was speaking at the one-week celebration to mourn the passing on of the constable. The police, widow, family members and residents gathered at the Tesano police station to remember Constable Daniel Owusu. He was in the company of other police officers when he was shot dead during policing duty by alleged armed robbers. But the director for community policing, ACP Habiba Chumesi, assured the incident will not affect community policing. It's an unfortunate situation and I'm sure all peace, love and Ghanaians are also not happy about what has happened. But we will continue to do our policing, we will continue to ensure that the community is safe for all of us. And we encourage all Ghanaians to support us support us with information that will help us prevent crime and also support us so that together we can make the community safer. Aged 35, Constable Daniel Owusu, before his passing, was an officer at the community police headquarters. Oh. We'll bring you more news here on News 360 shortly. Stay with us. Good evening, and it's time to bring you all the latest in the world of sports. Now, we start off with uh, the Confederation of African Football. They have adopted the resolution to expand the African Cup of Nations from 16 to 24 teams, with the new format set to be affected during the immediate um, you know, 2019 edition. The CAF Executive Committee passed their contentious resolution on Thursday in a long meeting held at Hotel Sofitel in Rabat, Morocco. CAF announced a shift from the 16 teams that have been competing in the biennial showpiece since 1996. The development means the format of the ongoing qualifiers for 2019 will be restructured to allow more teams so as to increase broadcasting and marketing revenue. This was one of the major proposals at the High Qadar CAF Symposium that ended on Wednesday. The changes will see club competition day changes, but above all, the staging of the African Cup of Nations in June and July rather than the current January-February slot, which every two years prompts club versus country wars between African FAs and European clubs. This will probably mean co-hosting becoming the norm because very few African countries can manage to stage the entire tournament alone as it is. Meanwhile, Morocco is reported to have committed to hosting the 2019 event should Cameroon fail to cope with the burden of the expanded tournament. The West African country that will be defending the title won in January and has recently been under pressure with critics doubting her preparedness for AFCON even before today's development. Ahmad, the Madagascar businessman and former government minister who ousted long-serving Issa Hayatu as CAF president earlier this year, is taking the credit for bringing about the programming revolution. But with all the issues surrounding these changes, it's perhaps necessary to have a breakdown and understanding of what these resolutions will mean to African football 
and its future. Mike Lutege has a lowdown on the AFCON expansion, which starts 2019. So his former now, the Nations Cup will now be a 24-team competition. It will take effect from Cameroon 2019. Now, the fact that Cameroon were given a mandate to prepare for a 16-team competition, but now have to prepare for a 24-team competition means a lot of things have changed. Someone has said it's like changing the rules of a football match midway. But effectively, eight additional teams, it has implications for the qualifying process. At the moment, the top teams uh, from the group stages uh, were supposed to qualify in addition to some top runners-up as well as the host nation. But as things stand now, it will require the top two teams from each of those groups to go through to the competition in addition to a few top runners up. In addition to that, there are suggestions that the host of the competition will change from Cameroon to Morocco. Many insiders in African football suggesting that that had been the plan as always. The CAF Executive Committee which ratified the decision will come out with the modalities but there is a major change coming up uh, in African football and that has been confirmed today. 24 teams instead of a 16 team competition the tournament as well will be played in June, July instead of February and January. All right, so now to some more Ghana football news. Now, it has been a week since Kotoko's tragic accident. There was a ceremony in Kumase to mark the one-week celebration of life for the equipment officer, uh, you know, who lost his life in the tragedy. Coach of the side, Steve Pollock, says his team will rise above it all and come out stronger. He spoke exclusively to TV3. After the one-week celebration of Kumasi Asante Kotoko's equipment officer, Kofi Asare's life, attention has shifted to when the team can get back to playing again. The team has missed their last two games in the Ghana Premier League and is looking to miss some more, including their FA Cup tie against NEA Salamina in Kumasi. The players say football has not crossed their minds since the accident. Medical officer of the team, Michael Lest, says he doesn't know when the team can return to the pitch, but he hopes it will be soon enough. We will assess them tomorrow again, but as to playing active football will take some time. You know. um, physically, they look okay, but some of them are mentally drained. So you need to kind of um, work on them, both on their physical parts and then on their mental part. And depending on where you sat in the vehicle, the impact of the accident on you is different. And as a team, too, we come together, we try to encourage ourselves because we want to come back, if not stronger than we were, maybe should be, we should be at par at the same level that we were before the accident. Kotoko's coach Steve Polak might be in the hospital still receiving treatment from the injuries he sustained in the accident, but he's still focused on his job. The Englishman says he hopes to join his team in training soon. It's been a good, hard week, but it's getting, each day is getting better. You know, a few, you know, two or three days by myself, you know, um, and then I should be fine. Those who did naturally travel on, on the dead, on the, dead, the game and the accident. And then um, we're taking another look with the doctor uh, over the weekend for those players that have actually been out now for two weeks, almost two weeks, ten days. And we're taking the decision over the weekend when can we start training with them again. Why don't we do some more football news and go straight to Europe, completing some transfers. And uh, Chelsea will complete the deal to sign Alvaro Morata on Friday after the striker completes a medical. He will be later, uh, you know, fly out of, uh, you know, Europe to Asia to join up with his new teammates as their preseason kicks off against Arsenal on Saturday. In Italy, AC Milan have completed the signing of Italy defender Leonardo Bonucci from Juventus for uh, 42 million euros. Bonucci has signed a five-year contract at Milan and is reportedly, uh, you know, supposed to become the best paid Serie A player. Finally, French champions, Ayers Monaco, have threatened to report any club that make an approach to Kylian Mbappe without their permission, uh, mentioning that about um, three or four important European teams are tapping up the player.
And that's exactly where we bring an end to the sports bulletin with me, Thierry Nyan, right here on News 360. We'll bring some more sports news. Just hang on because Africa Kansi is bringing you all of that. Welcome back to News 360. The Ghana Center for Democratic Development, CDD, has condemned recent comments by the Speaker of Parliament, Professor Mike Okwe, on gay rights, speaking on the sidelines of a 10th annual Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. Award. The executive director for the center, Professor Jima Bwedi, said the comment contradicted the Constitution. Speaker of Parliament, Professor Michael Quay, warned leaders in Ghana would not countenance the aggressive push by external forces to accept acts such as homosexuality during a curtsy call by Amnesty International. Speaking on the sidelines of the Martin Luther King Jr. Awards ceremony, Professor Jima Bwedi condemned the speaker's comments. He emphasized the need to defend and apply the Constitution, which guarantees the rights of all Ghanaians. The annual Martin Luther King Jr. Award has through the years recognized outstanding Guinean individuals who have embodied the philosophies of the late human rights activist. Executive Director of the Ghana Center for Demographic Development, Professor Jima Bwedi, was awarded for his contribution to promoting peace, social justice and respect for human rights. It's one thing if they were speaking as individuals and speaking to the religious faith that they subscribe to. It is fundamentally problematic when officers who have sworn to defend and protect the Constitution act and speak in ways that contradict what the Constitution has commanded all of us to do. United States Ambassador to Ghana Robert Jackson commended Professor Bwedi's contributions towards the peaceful 2016 elections. The CDD under Professor Jim Bwade's leadership has contributed significantly to shaping positive political outcomes across the continent. All right, so let's go to uh, some international news now, where uh, some news coming through. Former U.S. footballer, st football star and actor O.J. Simpson has been granted parole after nine years in a Nevada prison. So Simpson, who was acquitted for a double murder in 1995, has been serving time for armed robbery, assault with a deadly weapon and ten other charges. He is set to walk free in October after being convicted of a 2007 confrontation at Las Vegas Hotel. The former Hall of Fame running back was found guilty in 2008, exactly 13 years to the day after he was famously acquitted for the killings of his ex-wife Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ron Goldman. There's more international news on our website, 3news.com. Let's take a look at what's making news from the world of entertainment now. In entertainment this evening, his father, a soldier, dampened his desire to become a musician, but he defied the odds. I'm talking about, amazingly, his dad is his number one fan today and never misses any of his shows. That's rapper Don Ichi. He has been sharing his experience growing up in a military barrack. Be to be a cheap mammy, that be the level we are catch. A Santini, what's your answer? Can you see the better see a bass? Minimum send me boss the mic, be to be a messua. Whether we're in the Wuba try me, I will be to Messacua. We do Kesaya Minkasa, or Munin Messado, or speed the name a day, but no be crossing me and now we have. Growing up in military barracks, young Don Ichi was left with no room to pursue his talent. His father was against his idea of pursuing music as a career, resulting in several confrontations. The soldiers have the motive that if their kids take the talent channel, being it music or football or anything, they might not really make it in life. That, that used to be the initial thought. When I started, it wasn't easy. What was the initial challenge? Let's so, set so as an artist, let me make this simple and short. Ube di soja, da me yenyum. Ube kusku, da me yenyum. Ube di slapu, da me yenyum. Da me yenyum, da da tiu. Ichi 
wan ye dia mema bo ho apapao mi ni ha na rasta fo besra rasra o yesi ichi wa agwa na waje so yao yao da e yen sempi enya nyomu tunim bia so on and on my dad was against it my however mom. this did not stop the bema camp based musician from going after his dream of becoming a musician by god's grace i've been able to do a couple of top uh, uh, featureings i've had a chance to work with obra for ochia mekwame reggie rock stone tiny Master, Keche, Outu Beast, the, the list goes on and on and on. According to him, the visit by a man of God to his home changed everything. Our pastor visited and he was like, is, is this your son? And he was like, yeah, that's my son. And the, the man of God was like, ah, it's like I, I've seen him on, on telly before. What, what was he even doing? Rapping. He's very good. And my dad was like, yeah, that's my son. You know, it kept going on and on and on. He was like, wow. So if my son possesses this talent, why then have I been against him all this while? I have his full support now. My mom and my dad are one supporting me. And Bema Camp is behind me because they want someone to also emerge from Bema Camp, like a, a great talent to emerge from Bema Camp. So they would also be proud to talk about someone. His father is his number one fan now and never misses any of his shows. The amazing thing is now if I have interviews, he calls his people. He tells them to watch his son. He's so proud of me. Like, he talks about me everywhere. And whenever I'm with him and he meets people, he goes like, oh, that's my son, Don Ichi. Don't you, uh, don't you watch telly? He does music and all that. Don Ichi is poised to change the narrative associated with growing up in military barracks. He's holding his first musical concerts to encourage young children far and wide to pursue their dreams and also entreat parents to support their children and nurture their talents. They have given us the permission to do the program till night. It's back to the hood and remember like those that have left Burma camp are so much happy about this program that it's a way they will see their people again their old folks again coming back home is total excitement so 21st july 2017 happening inside Burma camp air force mess history that's what i keep saying there will be performances from daddy opanka yapono and wiser among others at the concerts for july 21 don ichi also intends to release three singles on the day Mm. Well, great to know his father is now his biggest fan. Yeah, so yeah, it all worked don't, out. Don't itchy. You know, I used to rap. You did, Alfred. You were telling me. Yeah, I used to rap. I wouldn't ask you to try because you just. Oh, they well. don't dare me to <laughs> rap. But well, <laughs> thank you, you for, so. for staying with us here on News 360. My name is Alfred Okanse. And I'm Natalie Ford. There's more news on our website, 3news.com. Next is Tashan. Have a lovely evening.